for everything that you know personally, people in the church that need strength. And let's just ask God to move into this service, that he would just have his way, that everything that is done would be done unto him, and that we would be able to hear and be open and ready to receive his words. God, we praise you and we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to be together as a church. We thank you, God, for all that you are, Jesus. God, we thank you for meeting us at this service. God, we thank you for the presence that we felt on Sunday. Lord, that is still here lingering, God. Lord, we ask that you would just have your way in this place. Lord, that you would move, God. God, that you would anoint every word, God. Everything that is done, God, we want to do it to you, Jesus. We want to worship you. We want to praise you, God. Lord, we love you, Jesus, for all that you are. We ask that you would touch every need, God. You see every situation. You see every heart, God. You see every healing that is needed, every blessing that is needed, God. And we ask that you would just cover, God, that you would work in these situations, that the glory would go to you, God. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Just so thankful to see your faces, Sister Courtney. I just took a call from my wife. I've been, we've been in a meeting, but uh, she is not going to be able to be here. Zach is acting up. So, uh, but think what good service that car has given for, it's a 2003, so it's, it's done well. But uh, she's going to be watching online. But I want you to know that we are, everybody say stretch drive. We're in the stretch drive in our final month to complete the remodel in time for our special Jubilee weekend, which is going to be May 17 through 19. I know you have that on your calendars. I know you're inviting people. We've sent out many, many uh, notices to people former uh, people that have been in fact that might want to uh, join us for that celebration because the 19th of Pentecost, we're going to rededicate the building on the 17th, but the 19th is Pentecost Sunday, and that is when we're going to celebrate 50 years, our jubilee uh, of Faith Apostolic Church of Troy, and we are looking forward to that. And there are many things that still need to be done uh, we're hiring several contractors brother david and i had about an hour and a half's meeting last night going over everything as it is at this point in time but i just want to encourage everybody to let brother david know uh, if you know how to use the church app he reaches out and lets lets everybody know things that are still needing to be done and let him know either in person or through the app what you might be able to do to help in this stretch drive. And then Jubilee Preparation Day is Saturday, April 27th. That is for the outside of the campus. We need to get everything done and in order and looking as, as great as we can make it look on the outside. And that's going to be Saturday, April 27th. And brother and sister Bourne will be coordinating that so as many of you as can if all you can do is spread mulch if all you can do is pull a few weeds uh, if everybody pitches in and helps that possibly can on that Saturday April 27th we will get this campus looking great uh, ahead of time for that Jubilee weekend we had a wonderful prayer meeting Sunday night uh, since I saw some of you with the North American missionaries, the Jimenezes from Miami, and there was such a powerful presence of God in that prayer meeting. They were so moved. In fact, they told me no one has in all of our deputation, even before our deputation, no one has ever prayed for us in the way that the church prayed for them Sunday night. So I let them know that those prayers will continue. Can I hear an amen? It won't just be a one-time thing, but we will not only be supporting them financially, we will be supporting them in prayers. We need to pray for two people that are, I can't, uh, I can see it's Philip James. I'm trying to think of the name. Sister Peggy 
son, Philip James, and many of you know him. He grew up here at FAC. We want to pray that God can open the door to get relief from AFib. He is right now, uh, has surgery scheduled in the month of, of May, and we, we need to really pray for him because AFib is something that is very, it's very tiring father really struggled with AFib, and uh, that's how I know all about it. It makes you very, very weary, but it also increases stroke risk. So we need to pray for him right now. Before we do anything else, we need to pray also for Sister Jean Cassett, who is back in the hospital. They had to remove about four gallstones that were in the duct between the gallbladder and the uh, liver, uh, but they got those stones removed. She's doing better. Uh, yesterday they did the MRI. She went home and then had to go back to the hospital again last night and that procedure was done today. So so if it's appropriate take someone's hand and let's have those points of contacts of joining together in prayer for Sister Jean Casa and for Philip James. Thank you Lord Jesus. Lord we come to you family members. We are so thankful, Lord, that when these things happen and they take us by surprise, we know that nothing ever takes you by surprise. And so, Lord, we are holding Philip up to you right now and asking you to release virtue into Philip's body to cause his heart to go back in regular sinus rhythm. Lord, I'm asking you to just stop the AFib, put his heart back into regular sinus rhythm. And Lord, I, I pray that he would just have a powerful, mighty touch through the authority of your holy name, Jesus, releasing virtue from the blood of your stripes into Philip's body. We are thankful that, that Sister Jean was able to get those stones out of that duct. Today, the doctors were able to do this. We praise you for that, but we pray now that you will strengthen her and cover her as she uh, recuperates from this procedure. Be with her. Let your covering be over her. I pray for her back situation also, Lord, and every situation in, in her life. Lord Jesus, I'm asking you to let your name be glorified through the release of virtue into these needs into these needs of these we we love and we care for lord and lord if we love and care how much more do you love and care and we are thankful lord that we can come boldly before your throne of grace lord to obtain mercy to find grace and overflowing of your grace in these times of need so thank you, Jesus, for the privilege of coming before you. In your holy name, we pray. Praise God. As you're still standing, we're going to look at Psalm 19, and I want to read the entire psalm in the Passion Translation. It's a powerful psalm, and we just experienced in our world, in our country, solar eclipse depending on where you were placed geographically but uh, the psalmist talks about the incredible creation of the Lord and how it is continually speaking to people in this world and it says Yahweh's word is perfect well let's start back in verse 1 God's splendor is a tale that is told written in the stars. Of course, the sun is a lot. Space itself speaks his story through the marvels of the heavens. His truth is on tour in the starry vault of the sky, showing his skill in creation's craftsmanship. Each day gushes out its message to the next, night by night whispering its knowledge to all. Without a sound, without a word, without a voice being heard, yet all the world can hear its echo. Everywhere its message goes out, 
What a heavenly home God has set for the sun, shining in the super tome of the sky. See how he leaves his celestial chamber each morning, speaking of the sun, radiant as a bridegroom ready for his wedding. Like a day-breaking champion eager to run his course, he rises on one horizon, completing his circuit on the other, warming lives and lands with his heat. And then it talks about the word of the Lord. Yahweh's word is perfect in every way. Can I hear an amen? How it revives our souls. Yahweh's laws lead us to truth. And his ways change the simple into wise. Yahweh's teachings are right and make us joyful. His precepts are so pure. Yahweh's commands challenge us to keep close to his heart. The revelation light of his word makes my spirit shine radiant. Yahweh's decrees are trustworthy. The fear of Yahweh is pure, enduring forever. The rarest treasures of life are found in his truth. That's why God's word is prized, like others prize the finest gold. Sweeter also than honey are his living words, sweet words dripping from the honeycomb. For they warn us, your servants, and keep us from following the wicked way, giving a lifetime guarantee, great success to every obedient soul. How would I discern the waywardness of my heart? Lord, forgive my hidden flaws whenever you find it. Keep cleansing me, God, and keep me from my secret selfish sins. May they never rule over me. For only then will I be free from fault and remain innocent of rebellion. So may the words of my mouth, my meditation thoughts, and every movement of my heart be always pure and pleasing, acceptable before your eyes, Yahweh, my only redeemer, my protector. Let's raise our hands and thank him for being such an incredible father, such an incredible redeemer, such an incredible teacher, such an incredible lover of us as his bride, the church. We love you, Lord Jesus. We honor you. My God, how great you are, how great, how great you are. So can we tell him how great that he is? Hallelujah, Lord, you're so great. My God, how great you are, how great, how great you are. How great. 
great that he is, how he personally has been so wonderful to you, how, how great his character is, how powerful that he is, how great, how great you are. God, you are worthy to be praised, Lord. We lift you up, Father, for you are wonderful, the creator of the universe, and also our friend. You are powerful, all-knowing, how great you are.
just want to be with you just want to be with you I just want to be with you. I just want to be with you. King of glory, fill this place. We just want to be with you. We just want to be with you. nothing that can even come close to just realizing the opportunity we have to be drawn into the Holy of Holies with the Lord on a daily basis. I, I really uh, 
look back at my life and I I think of those times where even as a, a preteen the Lord would draw me into that place in worship with him where I would just get lost in the presence of the Lord in, in worship. Sometimes it was just in a service. Sometimes it was in an altar service. Sometimes it was at home. But uh, because I prayer wasn't something that in my home that was just done at church. Prayer was something that was done in the home and, and some of the powerful flows of the Spirit of God that I experienced as a child I experienced it right in the home and prayer meetings with my mom and my dad right in our home. And I thank God for that. I look back at that and I deeply, deeply appreciate that they didn't expect me to get everything at church. But they realized that I needed to get it in the home. And the home and the church worked together. And I am just so thankful that I learned that at a young age. And I, I would just say to every one of us, let's never take for granted the presence of the Lord, the opportunity that he gives us to live on a regular basis, moving into his presence and, and not just looking at life. As I tried to preach on Easter, not just looking at life through natural eyes, but learning to see life through Easter eyes of what he has accomplished through his resurrection when he took that holy that holy blood after the veil of his flesh was rent and he took that holy blood and sanctified the heavenly tabernacle and he invites us to live in the real real tabernacle now in his presence praise God we're going to give of our tithe and offering right now, but I wanted to hold up this Jubilee Remodel Offering Pledge. I think most of you have, have filled out one of these probably by now. If you haven't, we have several left over, and this is a one-time uh, remodel offering pledge that we have asked you to pray about, and most of you have already given and turned in. If there's anyone that hasn't, we have them for you. It is something you can turn in as the Lord speaks to you the amount you should give to this cause. And we will, uh, these pledges will not come due until Pentecost Sunday. And our Jubilee service will have a special time of actually coming and giving the pledges that we made on Easter Sunday or subsequent to Easter Sunday. And this is going to help us in the stretch drive of our remodel so thankful. How many of you have peeked in and, and, and you've been able to peek in the sanctuary and seen the wonderful progress that's been made? Uh, and we just appreciate everybody that's working together on that. Um, Ted, I noticed that you had filled out that that prayer request for Philip. Please tell Philip how, how appreciative we are that he is allowing lot of that work to go on right in his shop of pre preparing things that will be a part of our remodel effort. So be sure that he knows that and how, how deeply we appreciate it. Now, Lord Jesus, you have invited us to play a part in our worship experience by giving. And we remember what David said. He said that of your own did he give back to you because he understood that the blessings that had come in his life were from your hand. And Lord, I, I hope, I believe most of us realize that. I don't know to what extent we fully understand and realize it, but we want to thank you for the way you have blessed us and made us able to then take that and return to you the portion that's yours according to the tithe principle. And then beyond that, to give offerings to the cause of your kingdom. Thank you for the privilege. Thank you that you made that avenue of worship open to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.
and visitors. Psalms 81 and verse 16, reading from the NIV. But you would be fed with the finest of wheat, with honey from the rocks. I would satisfy you. You may be seated. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the treasures of your word. And I pray that you would open our understanding to receive today. In Jesus' name. I knew uh, several days ago, maybe last uh, Friday or Saturday in my devotion, that this was going to be the uh, topic of my next message. And then when I, on a whim just decided I'm going to go see the eclipse in Dallas uh, area. I just, you know, I thought that e might eclipse this message, <laughs> but I decided to just uh, go ahead. I really felt like this was the word. And, uh, you know, we started our service with beautiful songs. Weren't they beautiful? I appreciate the praise team. Sounds good. I love the harmony. I love worship. And, um, it's a biblical thing to do. Outside of Psalm 90, which is a psalm attributed to Moses, which is, of course, a song, Scripture records two other songs of Moses, and both of them are very significant for two main reasons. We're going to have Bible study tonight. And I did not give every verse to the media people because I was just finishing at 7-Eleven as we drove into the parking lot. <laughs> But, um, and it was not for a lack of time spent on the message, um, when I was at the Fivefold Ministry Conference, Brother Woodward was talking to the teachers among us, and he said, the teachers have got to remember that not everybody wants all that stuff that you find just so captivating, and that you should just really enjoy some of that by yourself. So I have enjoyed some stuff by myself, and deleted pages and pages and pages of notes, and scaled it back to this message today. But these two songs of Moses commemorate key events in Israel's history. And uh, they also highlight the richness and the depth of the different themes that are so important to the big story of the picture of God's word. And it's really important because guess, guess what? It's still continuing today. And you and I are a part of that story. Exodus 15 tells us the first song of Moses. It's also called the Song of the Sea. And it's a song of praise and thanksgiving that Moses and the Israelites sang after they crossed the Red Sea. When they watched their enemies get swallowed up by the water, never to be seen again. I think I'd dance, too. I think I'd shout, too. At the end of that song, Miriam, the word of God, calls her a prophet. She got up and she took the tambourine and she led them all in worship and praise celebrating God's glorious triumph. That was the first song of Moses. The second song of Moses, Deuteronomy 32, is also called the Song of the Rock or the Song of Deliverance. And I considered that as I was studying kind of uh, Moses' swan song. And it was one of his final acts before he was passing on the leadership and before he, his death. And this song brought a sense of closure to Moses' ministry and also to this chapter of Israel's story, a very significant chapter in their history. But it was more than just a farewell speech, and it was more than just a showcase of Moses' legacy. It was a celebration of all that God had done. And an incredibly important teaching moment and the song is important because it summarizes in a very powerful way the history of Israel and it emphasizes that God is faithful. God is faithful. It warns against idolatry and disobedience and it foretells of future blessings and judgment and it's also important as God has been reminding me because Moses is so often interpreted as a type or a foreshadowing of Jesus. So it's not just about the Old Testament, because I really feel like I've spent a lot of time teaching Old Testament, and we need to understand that, but we're supposed to be living in the now, in the New Testament. So I want to learn that stuff, but I need to apply it in today's paradigm and concept, because we don't live 
under that type of church governance anymore. So, um, but Moses, his life, his actions, and his character, they paralleled aspects of Jesus' life and his ministry and his role as the Messiah. Both of them are called deliverer, lawgiver. Yes, Jesus fulfilled the law, but it does say he gave a new law, didn't it? Mediator, prophet, both of them, miracle worker, and shepherd. And as I was studying, I also saw some parallels between the way the children of Israel acted towards Moses and how perhaps even believers today might respond to God. And there is a reality that even God's people who have witnessed the miraculous, who have been saved from their enemy, delivered from slavery, might have a tendency to rebel and resist. Or to turn to idolatry and abandon a consecrated faith to the true and living God. Now, this isn't you, but some people might grumble and complain. Or there might be a division and disunity, as we saw then. And we might see in some carnal church somewhere. But I like to focus on the positive. You know, I turned um, the th- seven things that God hates. I'm like, well, let's look at the things he loves. It's got to be the opposite, you know. I don't want to just look at the bad stuff. I want to look at the good stuff. So I like to focus on that. And in Moses' songs, we also see examples of unwavering faith and obedience. We see meekness and integrity and spiritual maturity and renewal and restoration. And I want to see that in the church, don't you? But despite Israel's shortcomings, God was faithful to his promises. And in the church today, there's hope for renewal and restoration as we align ourselves with God's word and we commit ourselves to God's way. And I believe the Lord directed me towards this message because you know what? Life is messy. And life is hard. And the word of God speaks to us and sometimes it's really super clear. But a lot of times it just gives us like analogy so we can apply it to our life. Like, you know, when it talks about the waters, that's talking about instabilities and things. And when it's talking about the wilderness, and when it talks about the mountains, it talks about the valleys. When it talks about the wilderness, those are places that oftentimes are like separated from God. And in this concept that I'm talking about tonight, this world is a wilderness because humanity uh, has been separated from God. And so we've got to figure out how to live connected to God while we're still in the wilderness. Right? So we're all going to face opportunities for growth and for learning and spiritual transformation, and I believe that happens to us individually, and we all go through seasons. But I believe it's something that God wants to do to our churches, that his faith community, he wants us to grow. And he wants us to recognize that there are lessons that we can learn from these parallels that can help us navigate these complexities that we face in life as we seek him and as we seek to please him. So in Deuteronomy 32, Moses is speaking here, and I'm going to be reading from the NIV. Listen, you heavens, and I will speak. Hear, you earth, the words of my mouth. He's talking to a big audience. (laughs) I think that pretty much covers everyone, right? (laughs) Let my teaching fall like rain. And let my words descend like the dew, like showers on new grass, like abundant rain on tender plants. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Oh, praise the greatness of our God. He is the rock. His works are perfect a faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. In verse 2, Moses' teaching here means that he wants the people to understand the truth well enough that they can teach it. Take it. Seize it. Grasp it with your mind and understand it so that you can transmit it to the next generation. This kind of teaching is paired in scripture with wisdom and instruction and it relates to being a persuasive teacher you know teddy i bet there was a day you wanted something from your mom and you turned the persuasion on 
We know how to turn the persuasion on. But we're supposed to be able to teach God's word in such a way that it's effective, it's persuasive. We know it, we believe it, it's effective. God wants us to know his word enough that we're so convinced of it that we could persuade someone else of its truth. And who was Moses talking to? Was he only talking to the 70? Was he only talking to the Levites? He was talking to all the people. It was called the Ecclesia, the church of the wilderness. And what's the church called today? The Ecclesia, the church. We are the body. This word is for us, and it hearkens to the words of Jesus when he was about ready to make his transition. And what did he say to the people that he was leaving here behind? Go and make disciples of all the nations and teach them and baptize them. And by the way, you be sure of this, I am with you to the end of the age, but teach them the things that I taught you. In verse 3 of Moses' song, he spoke about proclaiming the name of the Lord. And in the Old Testament, the name stands for God, the person of God. And it reflects God's glorious attributes, his perfect character, his majestic qualities. It's the name by which God made himself known in covenant to Israel. And the name by which he has made known himself and fulfilled that covenant in Jesus Christ today. We proclaim that name. We proclaim that name. The name proclaimed is the name of our Redeemer. And there how many Redeemers is there? <laughs> there is one Redeemer. There is one Lord. There is one Savior. Kenneth Hemphill wrote, God's name stands for the manifestation of his presence. His name, that's why when we stand together in his name, there he is in the midst of us. He said in his, his name stands for the manifestation of his presence in his revelation and in his relationship to his people. I'm so glad. I know his name and he is worthy of the glory due to his name. He is a glorious God. He is our rock. If you read the words of this psalm, there is no rock like our God. He is a rock, and he is a fortress, and he is a deliverer. He is our refuge and our Savior. The Lord lives, and blessed be the rock, the God of our salvation. And there is no unrighteousness in this everlasting Deuteronomy 32, 5 through 8. We're not going to read it because that's talking about the unfaithfulness. I don't want to focus on that, do you? Oh, you don't have to focus on it. It's everywhere you look. But moving on to verse 9. For the Lord's portion is his people. He wants you. Jacob is his allotted inheritance. In a desert land he found him. In a barren and howling waste. God found his people in a desperate situation, because guess what? If you're living your life apart from God, I don't care if you're in a palace and you've got the world by the tail, you're still in a desperate situation because your clock is ticking. <laughs> Everybody's clock is ticking. But God found his people when they were in a desperate situation. He found them in a place that was empty but noisy. It had the sound of like wailing mourners, if you do a word study here, or howling animals, or howling winds. And doesn't that describe so much of our world today? It's empty, but very, very noisy. Empty, but full of winds blowing. Empty, but full of wailing and mourning. But God said, that's where he found his treasure. That's where he found his people, in the wilderness. And I believe there is also a treasure that you and I can find in the wilderness. There's a treasure in our darkness, even in situations that look hopeless. In verse 10, the word continues, he shielded him and cared for him. He guarded him as the apple of his eye. God 
encircled the community of his people. Guess what? You had to stay with the group. But he encircled the community, and he surrounded them on every side, and he protected them like he would protect his own eyes. You're going to protect your eyes? You're going to protect your eyes? You're going to put a high priority on protecting your eyes. It's an instinct. That's the way God's protecting you, instinctively, a high priority. And this same omnipresent God continues to surround his people. And when we are in him, we are protected on every side. Hallelujah. Protected on every side. It it doesn't mean that bad things won't happen, but you. Who you are, your eternal soul can be protected. He can keep your mind and he can protect your spirit. He can keep you. Psalm 512 tells us that God blesses the righteous and encircles them with favor. It's like a shield. I want to be circled around by the favor of God, don't you? He is our hiding place. Psalm 3210 says loving kindness surrounds the one who trusts in God. I'm liking this plan better than the rebellion plan. This is the better plan. Spurgeon said it eloquently regarding Psalm 32, 7, how he is our hiding place and surrounds us with songs of deliverance. Spurgeon said we are surrounded by dancing mercies, all of them proclaiming the triumphs of grace. Surrounded by dancing mercies, all of them proclaiming the triumphs of grace. If you are encircled by God in dancing mercies, do you think the enemy is going to be able to break that line? No, you are in a safe place. You are in a protected place. And guess what? It should be a very joyful place when the God Almighty is singing songs of deliverance. Hallelujah. He's singing songs over you. That's what the word of God says. We are absolutely safe in him. Can we hear the songs of God today? Can we hear hope crashing like the cymbals? Can we hear gratitude beating like a drum? And can we hear the sounds of victory won by God's amazing grace? In verse 11, I've spoken on it many times. It was the reason I felt a confirmation to speak this message like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young that spreads its wings to catch them and carries them aloft. Moses is reminding Israel that God led and sustained them when they were just an infant nature. They were just like teenagers. God carried them on his pinions, his flight feathers, his longest and strongest feathers, the ones that provide the lift in their propulsion. Tracking with me, Justin? Verse 12, the Lord alone led them. No one else. No foreign God was with them. There's a lot of talk later in this song about some other rocks. There ain't no other rock that can do for you what Jesus can do for you. No foreign God was with him, and he made him ride on the heights of the land. It says the high places. We, we're used to the King James, and we know what that's talking about, the high places, places where worship happens, right? He made them ride on it. If you study that in the, do a word study, it's talking about like riding up, getting up on an animal and being ridden upon these high places or on the back of a chariot. God says, here, let me mount you up on a, on a horse. Let me lift you up on the bird. Let me put you in the chariot and let me escort you and carry you over the high places. And this is the same high places that's so familiar to us if you've read Hannah Hernard's book, Hind's Feet on High Places. It's talking about my high place, the place where I've struggled, the place where you've struggled. He's going to lift you over those places. He's going to let you conquer and have victory over those places. God is going to elevate his people above the high places that they've struggled with in this earth. And this is all happening, my friend, before they step foot in the promised land, before they even crossed over the Jordan. We read this, and we're I don't catch the context of it. 
God, this word is not talking about in the promised land that he did this for them. It's talking about even before in the wilderness. In the wilderness before the promised land. When he fed them with the fruit of the field, he nourished them with honey from the rock and with oil from the flinty clay. I'm so glad that God is still finding people in the desert. He's still elevating people. He's still lifting them above their circumstances. And in the midst of the wastelands and the howling wilderness, oh, God is there. God is there, and he, like an eagle, he knows when it's time for them to start learning to fly and the comfy nests start getting broken up, and, but it's for their own good so that these young ones could learn to fly. But think about this in context. This is talking about Israel before it took the promised land, and there's some places that God wants us to take. The training happens where? In the wilderness. It was there that he called them the apple of his eye. Do you feel like the apple of his eye when you're in the wilderness? No, he made them uncomfortable. But sadly, Israel didn't learn the lesson. But we can learn to fly. That's what we're supposed to do. Let's learn together. As I was studying this week, I began to think of this passage in a new way. God began acting like this mother eagle, stirring up the nest. And how did he do it? In Exodus 5, he tells us, when Moses spoke to Pharaoh, what happened then? Pharaoh sent an order to the Egyptian slave drivers telling them, don't you give them any straw, but they better make the same amount of bricks. They were already slaves, toiling under the Egyptian sun. And they just got things made harder Then before, before they walked out of their bondage, things got harder. The people were put under distress. They scattered and they searched for stubble to use as straw, but they couldn't meet their quota and they got beaten. Hardly seems fair. Could that have been in God's plan? Sometimes things get uncomfortable. Right smack dab in the middle of the will of God. And what happened next? The eagle fluttered over her young. The plagues were loosed in Egypt. Frogs and boils and locusts and hail and darkness and death. But God, he covered his young. And some of those plagues that were so Difficult and hard on the Egyptians. They didn't affect God's people. Because God hovered over his people. There was light in Goshen. And the children lived. Hallelujah. What happened next? The eagle mother took her young ones up on her wings. God intervened. Protecting and guiding and delivering And he enabled Israel to travel over the high places. This is figurative language, and it's implying triumph, undisputed possession. And by this, this is all while they were waiting for the fullness of their promise. And yet God said he was victorious. And he said they were treasured. I'm victorious. You're treasured in the wilderness. And he provided for them in the most extraordinary ways, miraculous ways. He rained down manna. Human beings ate the bread of angels in abundance. God opened up a fountain in the desert, and he gave his people honey out of a rock. Who would expect to find honey in a rock? Yes, it's figurative. I'm not saying there was literal honey. But God wants his people to know, no matter where you are, No matter what you're going through, he is able to elevate you, and he is able to bring sweetness. Sister Jackie said the words today, sweetness and nourishment, and he will satisfy your needs even in the seemingly barren areas of life. 
We read from Psalm 81, 16, what could have happened to those who would have listened to God. He said, but you would be fed with the finest of wheat, with honey from the rock. I would satisfy you. And just a few verses before that, the Lord says in verse 10, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Open wide your mouth and I will fill it. And this is my heartbeat today. I see the, see the eagle's nest again. Open wide your mouth and God will fill it. Oh, if we would have expectation. The eagle's coming. He's not going to forsake the young. You can feel him when he moves in. But will you open your mouth? Will you let him satisfy the longing in your soul? God wants to fill his people. God wants to fill you. He wants to bring sweetness and nourishment into your hard places, into your dry places. And as we reflect on these verses, as Moses instructed in the will and purposes of God, we are invited to trust in the abundant provision of God who can satisfy our needs even in those seemingly barren areas of life. Honey from a rock is a picture of finding God's sweetness in places we never expected to find it. Honey in the rock, water in a stone, manna on the ground. God has a purpose and God has a plan. He always has and he always will and he will continue to provide. But it's up to us to look and to look to him and to look together. And Moses wanted God's people to memorize the song and he wanted his teaching to be like rain. It reminds us of the words of Paul in Ephesians 5, speaking of the washing of the water of the word meant to cleanse the bride of Christ, that she would be pure from any influence of the counterfeit rocks of this world and know the rock who is the only source, the true creator who redeemed us and gave us his own spirit. We draw from him what is in him, his own wisdom, his own righteousness. We draw from the rock, the rock that Moses struck in such a way that kept him from entering into the promised land. But the rock that Paul claimed to be Christ, there's no God beside him. And he's a God that's full of compassion. And he's able to bring honey to those who severe if he will open their mouths. Honey presents, represents God's words of life. Honey represents God's land. Honey represents rescue from slavery. Honey represents God's gift of grace. And honey lasts for centuries. Honey never rots. Honey stands the test of time. Honey will give you strength. Honey will brighten your eyes when you're weary in the battle. Honey will give you strength. God wants to fill his people to satisfy them. He said he's a rock in a weary land, and he is faithful and powerful and willing. He doesn't just have access to an abundant supply. He is the source of our supply. Honey from the rock speaks to our soul's need for spiritual nourishment that can only be found in God. It's sweetness that represents spiritual blessing that we find in him no matter what is happening around us. Much of Moses' song was a warning, and yes, there are warnings when we forget, but there are blessings when we remember. We must sing the song of God and take them to heart, and that's what Moses was saying. Don't just listen. Don't just memorize those words. Don't just sing them. Take those words to heart. Practice them. Perpetuate them. We've got to pass the baton to the next generation, and we've got to do it now. 
God is not dead. He is alive. His word is not fiction. It's a living word. It's a living word. Spurgeon said, he, in our hearts of sin and woe, makes living streams of grace arise, which into boundless glory flow. I love that picture. I'd say it again, but I'm trying to hurry. After delivering this song, Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite of Jericho, and he died there. He only got to look at the land, the possession, but you and I are privileged. We can enter into spiritual kingdom right now, and we can stand fast in the liberty that Christ has given us to fulfill the law by simply loving each other. We fulfill the law of God by loving each other as we love ourselves, by walking in the spirit, by demonstrating the fruit of the spirit and operating in the gifts of the spirit as we are nurtured from the rock, one fountain, drinking honey from one source. And this week I flew to Texas to see the eclipse with a ministry colleague. You can put that picture up for me. I'd been thinking about the sun for over a week, did a little study on it before, and um, I could have preached a whole message on this topic, of course. <laughs> Sister McCoy took this picture and every other picture I have and will be posting <laughs> because she's better at it, and it's just really good to have pe wonderful people that can do amazing things. Um, but I just wanted to add a component to this message because it really does relate. The sun, it looks the same to us all the time, but it's not. It's always active, and it's always dynamic. It's always moving. There's always stuff happening on the surface. There's eruptions happening. There's nuclear fusion. It's generating energy, and it's generating heat all the time. And if it didn't do that, guess what? We'd be dead. But did you know that almost every component on this rock called Earth is found in that gas ball called the sun? Do you know that everything sustaining life here is coming from that one singular fountain so that we can partake of it like honey from one rock? God's miraculous supernatural provision of one supply, every good and perfect gift comes from one source raining down love, joy, peace, goodness, gentleness, wisdom, healing, discernment. There is a flow, and it is streaming from heaven to earth just like the sun, and it can't be blotted out even during an eclipse. You can't stop the light of God. I was thrilled because I actually got to take the, the lights off, the glasses off and look at it because we had a total blockout for four minutes. It was amazing. There was something powerful happening in that moment. I can't really explain it or take the time to try. But what I want to make the point is that there is a flow that is constantly streaming here to you. There's a flow from a fountain, and it has everything that you need, one source, one rock. And we can be confident that God is going to provide everything that we need in him. In our wilderness, in our wilderness here, we are going to discover the undeniable sweetness of God. And so much goodness flows to us through his church. His goodness flows to me through you, through your hands and your feet. God wants to use us. There's freedom where the spirit is. And all of this is contingent with being connected to him, going to the rock and drinking from the fountain. And I want us to leave this place with a picture in our mind of God giving his people everything they need making his people to ride on the high places, elevating his people in triumph, God causing his people to ride on the high places in victory and dominion. 
God gives strength and favor to his people who align with him, who align with his word, who align with his way. He gives honey from the rock. And I can hear God saying to his people, open your mouth and I will fill it. Trust me. Have faith. Act in obedience. Act in confidence. And I will be faithful to you. Hallelujah. God, we want to be faithful back to you, God. We want to open our mouths. We want to respond to your word, to your grand invitation. We don't want to wander around in the desert for this long process, God. We want to be changed. It's our jubilee year. We want to stop struggling. It's time to eat the honey. It's time to take the provision that you have made for us, our God who is able to transform barrenness into abundance our God who's able to satisfy the deepest internal eternal needs of the human heart that goes so far beyond leeks and onions God reveal yourself He reveals himself in the wilderness. Ask Elijah. Ask Moses. Ask John the Baptist. Ask Jesus. The wilderness is the primary place where we meet God. It's the place where we encounter him, where we can taste and see him. If we go to the rock, he will be with us. Hallelujah. Stand with me. The Lord our God is in the midst of us, and he is mighty. He will save, and he will joy over his people, and he will rejoice over us. And we all stand there with our arms folded. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God. There's a river that's flowing, and it's the place where the Most High dwells. Jesus, we want to be with you. We want to taste. We want to we want to eat that honey from the rock. We want to have that wisdom. We want to be moving in the gifts. We want to be developing in the fruit of the spirit. You spoke your words of Moses to instruct us. God, today we remember you. We seek your face. We we see the warning and we see the path of destruction when we don't remember God. And so today we remember and we honor you and we celebrate you. We proclaim your name. Our Redeemer lives. Faithful and true are you, O oh God. We rejoice and we celebrate the only wise and living God, our Savior and our Redeemer. We worship you. There is no other God beside you. You are faithful and you are true. You found us in the desert place when we were howling and wailing in our lost condition. God, you reached out with your mercy and your grace and your goodness. You extended your love to each one of us. You lifted, you elevated us. You put your name upon us and called us into your family. You called us to be joyful in your family, God. Jesus, I pray for each one of my brothers and sisters here today and under the sound of my voice, God, that they would feel the love of God reaching, ministering, reminding them that they are your treasure and that there is honey, honey from the fountain, honey from the rock, strength wisdom, strength for the battle, the fruit of the Spirit in operation, not just for us, but that we might fulfill this work that you have called us to within the church and without. Be glorified, O God. Be glorified, O God. all conditional upon being aligned with his presence. 
the sun is shining. Let's see if we can throw our umbrellas up. We can take cover. We can hide ourselves from the presence of God. But God invites us. Come. Come and dine. Come and drink. Come and be satisfied. Come and sit at my table. There's room at my table. Come and be refreshed in my presence. In his presence, there's fullness of joy. Jesus. Let's just worship him together for a moment. Take a few moments and drink from the fountain. Let's just drink from the fountain. Let the spirit of the living God minister to your spirit today. God knows what you need. He knows if you need encouragement. He knows if you need comfort. He knows if you need wisdom in dealing with the situation. He knows if you're weary and you need strength for your battle. And he's got everything that you need. He knows if you need discernment in dealing with someone or you need help in relationship. He's got everything that you need. He can give you more of his love. He can flow through you. More of his goodness. More of his grace. He can help you develop in gentleness. Self-control. Every gift, God. Jesus, thank you. strengthening us. Thank you for the beauty of your word. Thank you for being a rock in a weary land and a shelter in the time of storm. Thank you for being a way maker and a deliverer. Thank you for being my very best friend. Thank you for your goodness and mercy that followed us all the days of our lives. Thank you for being faithful and true that we don't have to worry if you're going to change your mind tomorrow. You're faithful and you're good. Your loving kindness is a shield around us. As we leave this place, let us go out equipped with this imagery that you have given us in your word. Strengthen for this time in your presence. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you. How many of you have found him? so that he can show himself faithful. And what I have found is that he's helped me to know him better as I have gone through those things because sometimes it forces us to really get a closer to him. Focus us, it, it causes us to focus on him in a way we might not have had we not had the difficulty. So, even in a wilderness, even in a, a 
difficult place or a dry place. He's always hungry. <laughs> he is always our food. He is always a sustainer. How many of you have, can raise a hand and say, yes, God has taken me through some very difficult places that I didn't know that I could have made through on my own, but God took me through them. That's who he is. That is exactly who our God is. And so we sing for all my life. You have been faithful. For all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. One more time. For all my life, have been faithful. For all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. On Mondays, my wife and I take time give thanks to God. We try not to spend Mondays travailing. We try to spend Mondays praising and thanking God. We have a whole book of, of 10 different areas that we go through on Mondays, 10 different categories, and, and we, we say things from each category that we are thankful to the Lord for. We share that with each other, and then we pray about those things. One of those categories is one that you would not think you would put in a Thanksgiving category book, but it is for present and past trials. So every Monday in the Walker House, just as Christians, we are going through 10 categories together, and then one of those categories that you would think we would avoid putting in a Thanksgiving booklet is present and past trials and we talk about them how thankful we are and how God worked through that because I promise you if we'll stay thankful we'll keep our mouths open in expectation <laughs> you'll feel you'll you'll feel some of those drops of heavenly honey that will sustain you and you will then realize that you can be thankful for the very trial you would have wished to avoid in your flesh. That's how God is. Let's, let's just lift our hands and thank him right now. I don't know for each of us where we are is a unique place, but let's thank him for the present, or maybe it's you're not going through. Maybe everything's just great for you right now. You're not going through what you would consider a trial, but maybe you've been through it in the past. Let's thank God. Let's close this service by thanking him that there is honey that has come out of those very experiences. Thank you, Lord. I think about the trial Samson went through with the lion, but later he went back and he found honey in the carcass of that, that very lion that had come against him, that, that trial he had to endure. He found honey in that carcass that he was able to press to not only his own lips, to the lips of those he loved. And we want to do the same thing, Lord. We want to take the precious honey, your life-giving sustenance of your word that you give us, even in the difficult places, and press it to our lips and to the lips of others that we love. In your precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Go encouraged that no matter where you find yourself or what has seemed difficult lately, God is working through it for your good. We have that promise. That is that means God is working it so that we get our way. Some people interpret Romans 8.28 that way. It never says that. Romans 8.28 says that God is working for the good of his kingdom. For his purpose. And then the next verse says a part of that purpose is that each of us is conformed to his image. God bless you.